Hi everyone, my name's Mia, the lesser known voice of the Truly Criminal team. Before we start today's case, we wanted to thank Magellan TV for sponsoring us this week. We have been using Magellan TV for a long time now and recommend it to everyone, so we're very excited to talk to you all about it today. Magellan TV is an amazing hub for documentaries. History, biography, travel, science, and of course, true crime. With up to 20 hours of new content being added per week, there is always something to get stuck into. With true crime documentaries specifically, I want to feel like I'm in the investigation in real time. A documentary I watched recently on Magellan TV was called Double Murder Inside Story, and with this one, you really are in the investigation start to finish. It's so well put together and interesting, it's well edited and filmed, there's interview clips with the people working the case, CCTV, 999 calls, and I was completely gripped from the start. I also watched a few more videos from their new releases section and got a load of new recommendations which I will definitely be watching later. There's so many documentaries on there, some that are slightly shorter if that's what you like, and some that are full-on series if, like us, you want longer form content that you can binge on. We are so excited that Truly Criminal viewers will get a one month free trial by clicking the link in our description box at try.magellantv.com forward slash truly criminal. That way you can watch Double Murder Inside Story 2 as well as many other documentaries and you'll have to come back and let us know what you thought of them. Thank you once again to Magellan TV for this amazing offer for our viewers and sponsoring us today. March 9th, 2014, 11.30 p.m. County 911, what's the address of your emergency? Airport Road, 3385. Airport Road? Yeah, we just walked in the store and seen this guy down on the chain on the floor, it looked like they'd been robbed. Can you tell if he was injured at all? I've seen blood on the floor and he's down, I didn't walk back there and look. Okay. Ladies, and go look. The address at 3385 Airport Road was a gas station called Kanku's Express, located in Dalton, Georgia. Two of the store's regular customers had entered, finding it in a total mess. A man named Mark peered over the counter and noticed money, lottery tickets and other goods spread across the floor. There had clearly been a robbery, but there was no one to be found and he couldn't hear anything. Mark decided to take a walk around and spotting the door to the employee's area at the back was ajar, he peered in. He saw a person's legs and a lot of blood. He and the other customers quickly exited and were now waiting outside for the police. But whether or not whoever was behind the door was still alive needed to be confirmed. Another customer bravely decided to go back in and check. She didn't have to look for more than a moment to tell whoever it was was already deceased. The victim was the store clerk, 37-year-old Diaby Kalidas Chadari, known to everyone as DK. Born in India, he had travelled to America alone and from the second he arrived, he was willing to throw himself into a new way of life and work as hard as he could to start a new chapter. He loved America and said he instantly felt at home there. He had been in New Jersey for a while before moving to Dalton in Georgia, which he seemed to prefer a lot. As he had come over by himself, people said he had started to create his own little family in Dalton, becoming close to his co-workers and his customers. DK was now really starting to find his feet in a new routine. He had only been at Kanku's Express for a couple of months and typically worked the graveyard shift, starting at around 7pm. But late nights and long hours didn't ever deter him. His co-workers said the man who called everyone Buddy and greeted customers with a big smile made such an effort to remember the regulars and get to know the people he served. They said you couldn't have met a friendlier and kinder person. Always happy to talk to anyone about anything, whether they were known to him or just someone topping up their gas never to return again. He just wanted to make friends, work hard, and enjoy his new life in America. Everyone was in disbelief that this had happened to him. When police arrived at the store, 
it was evident the attack had been a very frenzied and vicious one, with the motive appearing to be a robbery. DK had tape over his mouth and eyes, and had been stabbed multiple times. He was covered in defensive wounds, and had tried hard to fight back. The medical examiner later determined he had survived the whole ordeal, only to bleed out about ten minutes after the attack had finished. On the floor under a trolley, near to DK's body, they found their first piece of evidence, a mobile phone, which was swiftly bagged up. With seven cameras covering the whole area, even if a few weren't working or were bad quality, detectives were confident they would be able to get something from them. They were elated, however, when they realised all of the cameras were working perfectly, and the images were pretty clear too. In the moments before the attack, DK was serving customers as usual and walking around the store checking the aisles. It was now around 10.30pm, about four and a half hours into his shift. Nothing seemed to be off, and as the store seemed quiet, DK headed over to the back room. Without warning, in a split second, the perpetrator appeared, chasing him from behind, pinning him into the back room. They were wearing a white hoodie pulled over their face, sunglasses, latex gloves, and a big black bag. DK tried to slam the door, but the killer was too quick. Once inside, they started stamping on him, brandishing a gun. DK managed to hit the gun away, and it slid across the tiles. But the perpetrator pulled out a knife and started stabbing him repeatedly before putting duct tape over his eyes and mouth. They then squatted down next to him before pressing their hands over his face suffocating him as he bled out. While all this was going on, there were now customers walking around the store, completely unaware as to what was unfolding in the back. The perpetrator then exited the back room and paced around the aisles. One customer by the name of Charles was now at the counter looking to buy a drink, but he was met with unbeknownst to him, the killer at the cash register, who shook their head and indicated Charles needed to leave. He walked outside quickly and afraid, and after the store was empty, the suspect proceeded to ransack the cash register area, taking a huge roll of lottery tickets and around $200 in cash. They took it all into the back where they had left their bag, shoving it all in there. They then calmly walked out of the store and off into the night. Police were shocked at just how cold-blooded, vicious and remorseless this crime was with some saying they had never even heard of anything like this in their careers, let alone seen it with their own eyes. Even though the footage of the murder happening did not show the killer's face, it was still a strong set of videos. It was clear, confirmed the timings, and showed the person's height, build and clothing very well. Charles, who had interacted with the suspect at the counter, came forward. He said it was a really unsettling moment and he didn't know what was going on but he knew he needed to leave the premises. Whereas the police initially thought they were looking for a male suspect, Charles's story made them realise they were not. Realising there was no one there to serve him, he went to the counter to pick up his card and leave. He then saw the person in the white hoodie lurking behind the register. He said she looked at him and said, we're not open for business. He told officers it sounded like she was putting on a fake voice. Looking back at the footage to just before the murder, the camera at the entrance to Cancun's Express showed the woman entering the store, but she was wearing all black. She headed into the bathroom where she changed into the white hoodie she would shortly be seen in. Detectives released the footage, feeling confident they could get a lead off of the back of it. And, very quickly, they did. It had now been just over 24 hours since DK had been murdered, 
and the police received an anonymous tip. The caller said they needed to look for a person by the name of Sky Raven Marie Mims, a 21-year-old model, aspiring rapper and dancer. Sky appeared to have no criminal history and wasn't known to the authorities at all, so this was a total shock and left the police wondering if they were seeking the right person. But there was another gas station across the road from Kanku's and this also showed her on these cameras too. In the footage, her hood was now down and they had a pretty clear picture of her face. She had even used her card in this station. No sooner had this tip come in that the forensics on the phone had also come back, and it belonged to Sky Mims. A statewide manhunt was now underway to find her, and the media were running with all the details. We are learning more in the stabbing death of a Whitfield County store clerk. Good evening, I'm Calvin Snead. And I'm Latricia Thomas. As the search continues for that suspect, the Cancun store owner remembers the employee as an extended member of his family. Right now I'm lost, in my mind is lost. Emotional words from a man that's lost an employee and friend. He's always have a smile in the customer and always, he's always, whenever you see him, always he's smile, you know. The lady came and this, uh, they, they, they're going in a, this door, go to the inside the register, and this lady hit him to the behind the neck. On store surveillance video, cameras caught the suspect leaving the store just a few minutes later. The customer came over there the, in the register, and they knock, and nobody said. Then the customer came back door, and they knocked the door, and nobody gave the answer. Then customer, maybe customer called the 911. The store owner believes Mim stole at least 90 lottery tickets after murdering the clerk. Whitfield County deputies believe that Sky Mims may be in the Atlanta area and is considered to be armed and dangerous. There was no indication as to where she was. Her last known address was in Detroit and it appeared she was bouncing from state to state. Following an extensive two-day search, Sky Mims was finally located. She had been hiding out in a friend's house about 30 minutes away from Dalton. When police knocked on the door, she had tried to escape. She was naked and screaming at the police to just shoot and kill her. She said, You saw what I did, you caught me red-handed. She was placed in handcuffs and taken out of the house wrapped in a bedsheet. On the way into the station in the back of the police car, she managed to wriggle out of the handcuffs, something which clearly unnerved the officer driving. Hi. You okay? You okay? Are you okay? Jeremy. Good. She's doing something to herself. She took off our cuffs. 925, you're going to pull over. In her first interview with the police, she was both aggressive and totally vacant before asking for a lawyer and walking up to the camera in the room and shouting and swearing into it. But officers were gathering so much from the house she had been hiding in that her refusal to talk didn't really matter at this point. Inside her bag were latex gloves, a roll of the same red duct tape that was found around DK's face, some of the lottery tickets, a gun and a knife with what they presumed was DK's blood still on it. There was absolutely nothing to suggest that Sky knew DK at all. It was a completely random attack and police argued that the second she walked into the store, she had already decided she was going to kill whoever got in her way. Her DNA was taken and quickly processed, confirming everything they already knew. The expert said she matched at all 15 locations for both gloves. The frequency for that is one in five quintillion, and the blood on the knife found in her bag matched DK. Sky Mims was charged, and a grand jury soon indicted her on several counts, including felony murder, two counts of aggravated assault, burglary, armed robbery, possession of a knife during the commission of a felony, and theft by bringing stolen property into the state, which was a stolen car. First of all, the aspiring model and rapper suspected of killing a man in Dalton is now in custody. 
The U.S. Marshals Service arrested 21-year-old Sky Raven Marie Mims in Bartow County last night. The GBI got a tip that she was staying at a home there. Mims attempted to escape when authorities arrived. Officials say the vehicle Mims had been traveling in was reported stolen in her home state of Michigan. But before this week, she had no criminal record in the Detroit area. She's accused of killing a gas station attendant at the Cancus in Dalton on Sunday. Mims was brought to Whitfield County last night and is being held on murder charges without bond. As the various procedures and hearings began, everyone that knew DK was still reeling from his death and the small community was left shaken in the aftermath. A collection jar was set up at the entrance of the store so people could send something to his family back in India and try and help in any way they could. DK's funeral was big, with a lot of people standing along the sides, including detectives who had been working on the case. Skye entered a plea of not guilty to all of the charges, and whilst awaiting trial, she faced a further felony charge of breaking a sprinkler head in her cell, which caused the cell to flood. Her charges were mounting up, and she now had 11 against her, but the most serious of all, felony murder, meant she could potentially face the death penalty if she was found guilty. Before her trial began, she was assessed by a psychologist who diagnosed her with bipolar disorder, but her attorney said she felt that her client had something more severe and undiagnosed. Her trial finally started just over a year after DK's murder. Brianna joins us now live in Dalton with details. Well, they definitely moved things along very quickly today, calling at least four witnesses, including the person who called 911. Now, after the jury was selected this morning, attorneys then ripped through their opening statements and then went straight to the witnesses. Sky Raven Marie Mims walked into court ready to stand trial today. There's a kitchen area in the store. She killed him in the kitchen. And she went back through that area to get to the register area. She cleaned out the register and took several hundred dollars from the register. District Attorney Burt Poston says surveillance video shows Mims casing several gas stations before the murder. In opening statements, Poston told the jury that Mims stabbed Chaudhari with a fish fillet knife, then taped his face and suffocated him. Deputies at that scene described what they saw. Uh, you said you saw blood. How much yes. blood did you see? A large amount of, I would say, probably covering two thirds of his body. The blood was underneath his body. Mims's attorney, Carla Marable, told the jury that Sky is naive and followed a man from Detroit to Georgia who promised to help her in her music career. I have Rick Ross and Young Jeezy and everybody. I'm connected. So come on. He gets her and Keisha Jones to come down. That second woman, Keisha Jones, is the person that her attorney says could have committed the crime. Keisha Jones and Sky Mims could be identical twins. That's how much they look like. Many who live in Dalton have chosen to go to court to hear testimony about her killing the man over lottery tickets. Carla Banks says a couple of her friends are sitting in on the trial. This is something big, um, really horrible, and I believe people, you know, they want to see the reaction and how things are going to be took care of. As the state presents evidence against her, Mims' behavior has captivated the city. It's so unexpected. and. Um, you know, if you look at the pictures of her in the paper, she's smiling or waving at the audience and, you know, you, you can't help but wonder about her sanity. John Brown has lived in Dalton most of his life. He, like many others, is now, fascinated by this case. It's not your simple cut, cut and shoot story, you know, it's a little more complicated than that. He says he's realized a brutal killing like this one can happen anywhere. I think this is one of those rare things that um, it surprised us all. And I got a feeling it'd be a long time if it, if ever it happens again. During the proceedings, Sky either sat and laughed or just stared into space, completely void of any remorse, but seemingly enjoying the attention when she saw people looking at her. She had asked to testify on her own behalf, but her attorney had said no. Many testified, including friends of Sky who said that in recent months she had become totally obsessed with winning the lottery. She was focused particularly on winning one that could give her $500 a week for life, and these are the exact same tickets she had stolen from the store. Friends said she thought if she won, she would be able to pursue her dream of performing without worrying about funds. After five days, the juries entered their deliberations. 
jury find the defendant, count one, malice, murder, guilty. Count two, felony, murder. It took less than an hour for them to return a verdict of guilty on all counts. On the grounds of mental health issues and a previously clean criminal history, Skye's attorney was pushing for the chance of parole to give her a second chance. But the judge said she was read her rights and was more than happy she understood them. Skye's father Mario gave a statement as well, describing their family history of mental health issues, including bipolar disorder and paranoid schizophrenia. Mario also said Skye would tell people she was being chased by aliens or that people were trying to kill her. Mario had tried to check her into a hospital, but she had left quickly before stealing a car and fleeing. He said, she kind of slipped out of our hands. We couldn't grab her, touch her, nothing. Despite both he and her attorney's protests, Sky Mims was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. It's the emotional conclusion to a story we first brought you last year. <laughs> on count one that you uh, are in prison for life without parole expressionless court officers led sky mims a convicted killer out of the courtroom an unusual lack of emotion because of her erratic behavior such as uncontrollable laughing throughout the trial her attorney attributes her outbursts to mental instability i believe that miss mims mental health issues has not allowed her to understand. I think that she doesn't understand what has happened. In 30 years, I think that she would be, it would be safe for society. She would have had the mental health care. In 30 years, she would be 50. I'm crushed and hurt for both. Both families are hurt. Um, it's a tragic situation. It's likely Mim's family will appeal the judge's decision. Depend on us to let you know if that happens. Reporting live in Dalton, Kelsey Bagwell, News Channel 9. The judge took the potential death penalty off the table after her bipolar disorder diagnosis. And when Skye's attorney expressed her disappointment at the sentence given, the judge pointed out he had already been lenient enough in taking the death penalty out of the equation. He called her crime methodical, vicious and senseless, and was particularly disgusted when she had started laughing as the evidence was presented. He said life without parole was more than justified considering the circumstances. The defendant has shown zero remorse. She has shown zero acceptance of what she did. We don't think she should ever be free again, he said. It was a good result for the prosecution, and they said we are pleased, obviously. We're happy for the community and happy for the family. The evidence in this case was overwhelming, so the verdict is not unexpected. We're just glad to get the case tried and get closure for friends and family that lost a good man. It was soon announced that Skye was seeking a new trial. As a result, in 2019, the charge of theft of a car was reversed, but the murder conviction was upheld, and Skye remains in prison, still serving out her life without parole sentence. DK's body was eventually sent back to India to be with his brothers, but the loss his co-workers and friends felt back in America ran deep. He had built a nice life for himself there, and made so many new friends. He had many plans and dreams. It was such a heartbreaking end for him. One of his friends said, DK's smile could brighten your day. He never met a stranger, he spoke to everyone. He would give you the shirt off his back if you needed it. He was so kind and had the biggest heart of anyone I know. We are so grateful to all of our viewers and all of our patrons and we'd love you to consider joining our little community over on Patreon. It supports us as a channel and we couldn't be more appreciative of anyone that does so. It also gives you behind the scenes, extra episodes and early ad-free access.